Thank you for joining today's event on ICD 10 CM General Coding in Overview. I'm Jen Godro, VA, CPC, CPMA, CPEDC, a HEMA approved ICD 10 CM PCS trainer. I've created training and tools for ICD 10 coding, compliance, and workflow. I've educated thousands of physicians, providers, coders, and consultants on the ICD 10 system guidelines, documentation, specialty specifics, IC9 comparisons, and revenue impact. Supercoder's revolutionary practical specialty specific approach to ICD-10 training encourages practices that they can do ICD-10 with efficiency and financial success. Today we will review the general coding guidelines for ICD-10 CM. When you complete this session, you'll be equipped with knowledge to make your IC10 transition smoother. The general coding for guidelines for ICD10 remain mostly the same in ICD10 as in ICD9, but there are some differences. Many of these guidelines exist in numerous different areas, just like in ICD9. You have both official guidelines that are located in separate PDFs as well as information that appears prior to a chapter or subcategory section. The first guideline for the official separate PDF involves assigning the correct code. Regardless of the reason for the visit, code selection has to be based on clear documentation in the medical record. You will look up a code in the same manner in which you currently look up codes in ICD-9. First, locate the main term in the alphabetic index. Then verify it in the tabular list, including laterality and any applicable seventh character. And remember, those might be located prior to your specific area if you're working with uh, non-electronic products. The alphabetic index isn't usually going to provide you with a full code. Therefore, never code directly from the alphabetic index, but verify your code in the tabular list. You need to be sure to review instructional notes that are located in both the alphabetic index and sometimes repeated in the tabular for optimal and complete code assignment. You'll want to look for things like use additional code, excludes one, and code first notes. The second guideline pertains to the level of detail in coding, which you should already know. It means you have to code to the highest level of specificity. Code until you can code no further. This means your final code may be three, four, five, six, or seven characters long. A three character code is considered complete if it cannot be further divided. If it can, and you can assign it anyway, it is considered to be an invalid code. You must assign more characters for greater specificity. The third guideline outlines the code ranges for ICD-10 code. Keep in mind this coding system captures information other than diagnoses. Codes A00.0 through T88.9, and my favorite zoo code, the 00 through Z99.A identify diagnoses, symptoms, conditions, problems, and complaints. The V codes describe the environment, events, and circumstances that cause the patient's injury or other adverse effects. You'll see these codes as secondary to codes from other chapters. The fourth guideline relates to signs and symptoms. You want to look for a definitive diagnosis that the physician documents. Only use codes for signs, symptoms, or other complaints found in the medical records when you can't determine a definitive diagnosis. When a diagnosis has been established that the patient exhibits additional signs and symptoms not integral to the disease process, then code those signs and symptoms. Guideline 5 states that if the signs and symptoms are integral to the disease process, then you should not encode not code them. An example, the patient has abdominal pain as a symptom, but the provider has given a definitive diagnosis of colitis. 
you would not code the abdominal pain as it is a symptom of colitis. So we'd be redundant to code a symptom of a definitive diagnosis. Chapter 18 of the IC10 tabular list contains many, but not all, of the codes for signs, symptoms, and abnormal clinical and laboratory findings. These are found in the code range R00 to R99. Guideline 6 states that if signs and symptoms are not part of a disease process, you should assign them. The seventh general guideline involves multiple coding of a single condition. In some cases, a condition that a physician diagnoses may have an underlying etiology and associated condition. It's imperative that you follow the guidelines in the instructional notes for proper sequencing of codes. Code first notes are seen with codes that are not necessarily manifestation codes, but may be due to an underlying condition. If you see a code first note, you will code the underlying condition first. Use additional code as a note that you'll find in the tabular. When you see this note, you will have a secondary code to list in addition to the primary code. Code is applicable. Any causal condition first note tells you that the code may be assigned first when the causal condition is not known or not applicable. If the causal condition is known, then you should code that condition as the primary. You should be aware that you may need to report multiple codes for late effects, complication codes, and obstetric codes. In the example on slide 9, you see the following code first note instructing you to code a specific underlying disease before you list the respiratory code. You should first also code the underlying disease, such as amyloidosis, congenital syphilis. Another example used on diagnosis code J98 for other respiratory disorders. Here you see a use additional code note. When you've completed the code, you follow the instructions and code a specific cause of a respiratory disorder in addition to the primary code. With the additional code, you identify environmental tobacco smoke exposure, exposure to tobacco smoke in the perinatal period, history of tobacco use, or other additional conditions. Let's try an exercise. Ms. Clark, age 21, comes into the office complaining of itchy eyes, a stuffy nose, and excessive sneezing. The nurse practitioner examines her and diagnoses her with seasonal allergies. Then she gives Ms. Clark some drug samples and tells the patient to come back if she does not improve. How would you code this visit? Some options, J30.1, J30.2, R06.7, and R09.81. And the answer is B, J30.2, for other seasonal allergic rhinitis. And the reason for that is that you have symptoms in addition to the definitive diagnosis in this example. And since the symptoms are a part of the disease process, you would only need to code the seasonal allergies or the definitive diagnosis and not the signs and symptoms. So you see this is similar to how we do it in ICD-9. Guideline 8 involves coding for acute and chronic conditions. A patient may have a condition that is both acute and chronic. Code both the acute and chronic forms of the condition. So let's look at an example of a patient who could have both acute thyroiditis as well as chronic thyroiditis with transient thyrotoxosis. Here you can report both codes. But keep in mind that an acute condition requires immediate and primary attention. Therefore, you list it first. And that's a little bit of a, a different kind of guideline in which we have to report both the acute and chronic when they're not mutually exclusive. 
Guideline 9 indicates that a combination code is a single code used to identify one of the following. Two diagnoses, a diagnosis with an associated manifestation, or a diagnosis with an associated complication. Rather than coding multiple diagnoses for a condition, you may find that ICD-10 already has a single code that reflects the combination. You can only assign a combination code when the physician fully identifies the diagnostic conditions involved or when the alphabetic index directs you to the combination code. Don't use multiple codes when a single combination code clearly identifies all of the elements that exist. If the combination code lacks certain information needed to describe the condition fully, use an additional code. You'll see several combination codes when coding diabetes. Guideline 10, a sequela or late effect is the residual effect that occurs after the acute phase of an illness or injury has ended. There isn't a time limit specifying when you can start using a late effect code because late effects vary in presentation. When you code late effects, you'll generally need two codes. You should sequence the condition or nature of the late effect first and follow it with the late effect code for the acute illness that has now passed. There are exceptions to the sequencing for late effects. You may encounter instances when you will report the late effect code first, followed by a manifestation code as identified in the tabular list. Another situation is when the late effect has been expanded, the fourth, fifth, or sixth character to reflect the manifestation. You should never report the code for the acute phase of an illness or injury that led to the late effect, in addition to the code for the late effect. On slide 17, you'll see guideline 11, which is important to know to follow for any condition that is described at the time of discharge as an impending or threatened condition. If the condition actually occurred, code it as a confirmed diagnosis. If the condition did not occur, then you can reference the alphabetic index to determine if the condition has a subentry for impending or threatened. You can also check for main terms such as impending or threatened. If you find a subterm, then assign the given code after cross-referencing the code in the tabular list. You may also find the code under the main terms, impending or threatened. If you don't find your code under these main term entries or in the subterm entry, code the underlying condition and not with the position described as impending or threatened. Guideline 12 states that you can't report the same diagnosis code more than once. If a patient has two different conditions that a single combination code describes, then you should only report that single combination code once. This rule applies also to bilateral conditions when you don't have any distinct codes describing laterality. Guideline 13 represents a major change in the IC10 general coding guidelines involving laterality. Always assign a code that represents the appropriate side of the diagnosis or condition, specifying the left side, right side, or bilateral. If the patient's condition is bilateral but there is no code for the bilateral, assign both a code for the left side and a code for the right side. Let's discuss guideline 14 and documenting BMI and breath and pressure ulcer stages on slide 20. Someone who is not the patient's provider, such as a physician or qualified practitioner, legally accountable for establishing the patient's diagnosis, can document, document the patient's body mass index or pressure ulcer stage. You can use this information as long as the patient's provider also documents the associated diagnosis such as overweight, obesity, or pressure ulcer. Often, a dietitian may document the BMI or a nurse may document the pressure ulcer stage. If you discover conflicting documentation, then you should ask the patient's attending provider for clarification. You should report BMI codes as secondary diagnoses as long as they meet the definition of a reportable additional diagnosis. 
you report pressure ulcer stages as a secondary diagnosis as well. Guideline 15 states that when you are coding for syndromes, you should follow the index to find the code that you need. If you can't find the code under the main term syndrome, then assign the code for the manifestation of the syndrome. You can assign additional codes for manifestations that are not an integral part of the disease process when there is no specific code for the condition. On slide 23 is an example of IBS. A gastrointestinal disorder, and you'll find the, this uh, syndrome in Chapter 11. ICD-10 doubles your code choices for IBS. You need to check the documentation to see if the patient does or does not report diarrhea. Code K58.9 K58 applies when the patient states he is not experiencing diarrhea, and if there is no mention of the symptom, if the code also applies, IBS and OS. To find out more information about coding for IBS, you can look to IC10 Coding Alert, where you'll find articles, tips, and other helpful solutions to coding, billing, and reimbursement issues. With the subscription, you can type in the code or keyword into the search box to find issues of IC10 Coding Alert covering the topic you searched. Newsletters only $199.95 annually and includes 24 AEPC or 5 AHEMA CEUs. And here's a recent article, Coding for IBS. Let's take an example on slide 26 of a patient presenting with a complaint of a six-month history of diarrhea, constipation, and frequent gas. The patient's also been noticing mucus in her stool, and she indicates that this often occurs when the patient eats something does not agree with her or near the exam time. The physician documents IBS. How would you code? This is a kind of an easy give away. So here, like in our allergy one, we're going to code only our definitive diagnosis. But here we've got a combination code. So our answer is B, K58.0, IBS with diarrhea. And so you're going to use that combination code rather than the, the sign in addition to the syndrome. Let's look at guideline 16. As a coder, you're required to code based solely on what your physician documents in the medical records. You should never make any assumptions. When you encounter a complication of care, you need to look for a cause and effect relationship between the care provided and any complications. Your physician's documentation should indicate the connection in order for you to code it. When it's not clear if the patient's condition resulted from a complication of care, make sure to go back and query the physician for that extra information. Guideline 17 regards borderline diagnoses. And this is when you may see in documentation a borderline diagnosis of diabetes. And sometimes physicians document a condition as borderline for the diagnosis at the time of discharge. If this is the case, you should code the condition as a confirmed diagnosis. So, for instance, if documentation indicates borderline diabetes mellitus, you use diabetes as your code. So you're coding it as the condition has been confirmed. A condition that is borderline is not the same as one documented as an uncertain. Therefore, you will code the condition as mentioned for borderline conditions. There is no distinction between inpatient and outpatient status when coding borderline diagnoses. Guideline 18 applies to signed symptom and unspecified codes. You'll always want to code the specific disease as documented in the medical record. However, there will be times when signs or symptoms or unspecified codes need to be used to fully reflect the findings of a patient encounter. 
You must code based on the level of certainty provided in the documentation. If a firm diagnosis has not been established by the end of the visit, then it's appropriate to code using signs or symptoms provided in the documentation. When your physician does not provide enough clinical information, then you may use the unspecified code for that condition. Before defaulting to unspecified, make an attempt to see if there's documentation that would allow you to provide a more specific code. Take note that it is unethical and inappropriate to use codes not supported by the medical record or to conduct unnecessary testing in order to use a more specific code. And one update that came out recently on non-specified codes came out from CMS on July 6th. And in that, they indicated that there would be a one-year hold on denials for codes that are unspecified. And that's in order to allow everybody to get up to speed with the added documentation areas. Obviously, the intent is to still push people to the more specified codes, which was the entire intent of ICD-10 to have that more specific diagnosis coding. One great way I think of, of kind of looking at this is to look at the code and see, you know, are we really asking for extra documentation or is it something that's probably already part of the medical record that we're now are only asked, being asked to capture additionally? And to maybe make that your educational line in order to encourage physicians to learn the correct new specific codes, in addition, um, by allowing them to have a little bit more time when there may be codes that would be beyond um, the documentation that they currently have. So kind of allowing them to grow into it. So the first year you say, okay, um, let, let's say we have diagnoses for the ears and we're specifying an ear. Most likelihood for an ear infection, we'd expect to see what ear is, uh, is affected. And through so that, we can pull out and have for our more specific codes rather than defaulting to an unspecified ear code. However, if it's something like some of the new eyelid codes uh, in the eye section where the physician has to, in addition to documenting right or left, which he previously did, need, now needs to also document upper or lower eyelid, that may be something that he's not accustomed to indicating. Some people do have pictures and images of where that is, but if you don't have that, that may be the thing where the second year you're continuously, your your goal is to meet that for that second year, and so during the first year you're, you're continuously coaching on adding that additional information. You can sign up for SuperCoder's blog to get more news as it's announced on ICD-10 changes. We've also added a new great tool of an ICD-10 training of the day. So it's one slide, one code from ICD-9, and how is it going to change for ICD-10? A really simple, fast way uh, each day to get up to speed on one more commonly used code, and that you can register for on SuperCoder. Let's move on to coding some common comorbidities and the associated official and chapter guidelines that apply to them. You'll find hypertensive codes in Chapter 9, Disease of the Circulatory System. Hypertensive diseases refer to conditions caused by high blood pressure. ICD-9 has six codes to describe essential hypertension and hypertensive heart disease, while ICD-10 has only three codes to describe these conditions. ICD-10 contains additional hypertensive disease codes under categories I-12 to I-15, including hypertensive chronic kidney disease, for I-12, hypertensive heart and chronic kidney disease, I-13, and secondary hypertension with I-15. Watch out for documentation of the following conditions listed on slide 34, because there are official guidelines in ICD-10 that you need to follow to assign codes for them. And that includes conditions such as hypertension with heart disease, with chronic kidney disease, hypertensive heart and chronic kidney disease, and so on. In ICD-10, heart conditions classified to I-50, or I-51.4 to 151.9, assign a code from category I-11, 
hypertensive heart disease when a causal relationship between the heart condition and hypertension is stated due to hypertension or implied hyperintensive. Assign codes from category I-12 when both hypertension and a condition classifiable the category N18, which is chronic kidney disease, are present. Unlike hypertension with heart disease, ICD-10 presumes a cause and effect relationship and classifies chronic kidney disease with hypertension as hypertensive chronic kidney disease. Let's find the appropriate code from category N18 as a secondary code with a code from category I-12 to identify the stage of chronic kidney disease. If a patient has hypertensive chronic kidney disease and acute renal failure, assign an additional code for the acute renal failure. Assign codes from combination category I-13 for hypertensive heart and chronic kidney disease when both hypertensive kidney disease and hypertensive heart disease are stated in the diagnosis. Assume a relationship between the hypertension and the chronic kidney disease, whether or not the condition is so designated. If heart failure is present, assign an additional code from category I-50 to identify the type of heart failure. For hypertensive cerebrovascular disease, first assign the appropriate code from categories I-60 to I-69, followed by the appropriate hypertension code. For hypertensive retinopathy, assign subcategory H35.0 background retinopathy and retinal vascular changes with a code from category I-10 to I-15 hypertensive disease to include the systemic hypertension. The sequencing is based on the reason for the encounter. So you're going to look at what the main treatment is that the visit was geared at. So typically I look at, you know, primary care versus specialist and what is the concentration of that visit. If we're doing something like hypertensive retinopathy and we're at primary care, I would expect that the primary care visit was based on the hypertensive disease. If I was looking at an ophthalmology visit from a, an ophthalmologist, I would anticipate that the retinopathy was the main reason, the main treatment uh, of the visit that the ophthalmologist was focused on and the hypertensive would be coded secondarily because that was associated with it and not the main focus of the visit. Secondary hypertension is also due to an underlying condition. So here you define two codes, one to identify the underlying etiology and one from category I-15 to identify the hypertension. Again, you're going to determine the sequencing based on the reason for the admission or the encounter. So what was the primary focus of it? For transient hypertension, assign code R03.0, which is elevated blood pressure reading without diagnosis of hypertension unless the patient has an established diagnosis of hypertension. For transient hypertension of pregnancy, assign code 013, which is gestational pregnancy-induced hypertension without significant proteinuria, or 014 for preeclampsia for transient hypertension of pregnancy. For hypertension controls, the diagnostic statement usually refers to an existing state of hypertension under control by therapy. Assign the appropriate codes from category I-10 to I-15. For hypertension uncontrolled, the diagnosis may refer to untreated hypertension or hypertension not responding to a current therapeutic regime. In either case, define the appropriate code from I-10 to I-15. You'll also find at I-10 an additional code note to identify the cause or risk including exposure to environmental tobacco smoke, history of tobacco use, occupational exposure to environmental tobacco smoke, tobacco dependence, and tobacco use. At I11.0, hypertensive heart disease with heart failure, there's an use additional code note. That means you need to use an additional code to identify the type of heart failure. Under I-10 to I-15 in the tabular list, you'll also find an exclude one node 
meaning not coded here, for hypertensive disease complicating pregnancy, childbirth, and the puritorium, neonatal hypertension, and primary pulmonary hypertension, which are all excluded from categories I-10 to I-15. On slide 38, we see how Supercoder opens up the different areas so that you can understand how the sixth character is chosen when you have only a limited amount of characters in the family guide. So here we see over here on the left, we've got H35.0, which needs a fifth code. So we can open that up and get our subcodes. Similarly, here we see the other H35.0s, and we can open up those in order to then see the hierarchy underneath. So if we know we want to be in changes in retinal vascular appearance, then we know, or hypertensive retinopathy, we can look at that and then go down to find more specific code. Supercoder also allows you to put a note in there so that if you're trying to figure out who's going to pay on the unspecified codes or not, um, you can start uh, tracking that and making sure that uh, you, your coding is optimal for your reimbursement as well as being accurate, and that's the call. On the right-hand side, once you pop up in one of these details, then you'll see the full code descriptor. And here's where you can find in Supercoder that use additional notes so that you're reading that guideline right at that code level. And here are those lists of those different codes that you would report in addition to that. So we've pulled this information out of the official and the tabular and put it right here at your code level. Uh, code search is part of the physician coder suite of products, which also includes a scrubber, one coding alert, uh, that you can choose from about 36 different titles of, as well as numerous different crosswalks. Let's take a look at how diabetes is impacted. And when your diagnosis coding system changes, you'll no longer flip to the same code section for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Although you're currently accustomed to starting off with PCOS, 250 for all diabetes patients, your coding options expand dramatically under ICD-10. ICD-10 diabetes codes are in Chapter 4, Endocrine, Nutritional, and Metabolic Diseases. In 10, you have to report type 1 diabetes with E10 and type 2 diabetes with E11. These are both six-digit codes. The fourth digit of character specifies the organ system that shows some manifestation, such as ophthalmic, neurologic, renal. And the fifth, the sixth character elaborates the type of complication. For type 1, you'll code all type 1 patients with E10. And then you'll move on from there after reviewing the patient's chart to determine whether any further manifestations exist. For type 2, you'll use E11 and then go ahead in order to complete your characters by reviewing if there are any manifestations. For instance, a family physician reviews a 50-year-old patient with type 2 diabetes and kidney complications. The physician diagnoses diabetic neuropathy due to diabetes, and in this case, you would use E11, because you know it's type 2, and then you're going to scroll down the diabetic nephropathy. So you see where your complications are there. So you would be under kidney complications under this two area and then continue on for your specific uh, problem. So let's see how it would work for diabetes with ophthalmic manifestations, which occur when a patient has ophthalmic conditions as a result of diabetes. As you see, for many of the codes in this series, the sixth digit represents with or without macular edema. A big difference when coding diabetes in ICD-10 is that you no longer need to code the particular manifestation with the clinical condition. In ICD-10, does not allow you to report codes together from both E10.3, the type 1, and the type 2 for the same. 
you do need to code an additional code to identify the patient's long-term current insulin use. And that is V979.4. So that's when you're going to be using any time that you use the diabetes code and there's a documentation of that insulin use. And I think that is one of the things to remember is a lot of times people are thinking, okay, now in ICD-10 I have all these combination codes. I'm only going to always report one. But here you see even though you can report, um, you don't have to report separately diabetes and the manifestation, you have a combo code for that. But you still are at an even game because now you have to add in the Z code as appropriate. Codes for pregnancy, childbirth, and the perforium always take sequencing priority, even for diabetes. The codes for diabetes in a pregnant patient have expanded in ICD-10, and the fourth character subcategories identify the type of diabetes, such as pre-existing with type 1 or type 2, or if you don't have that specification, that default is unspecified. And here's another example on slide 44 of how we show that in Supercoder where you can see uh, some of the notes that are in the tabular are appearing here for your base code. Um, and that's been pulled from the area. And then you also see that again repeated in the details page. So just so two different kinds of ways of looking at it and seeing it um, based on your individual preference. Some people like to have the whole hierarchy and you can do that. Um, you can search and go to the hierarchy, or you can search and go directly to, to this. It's, it's all integrated. You also get the uh, symbols from either the outpatient code editor or other locations to indicate uh, if there are age um, and gender edits applicable to those codes. So let's take another example. A 25-year-old patient with diabetes type 1 in her second trimester at 18 weeks, visits her OB for her routine follow-up visit. The patient's blood sugar is well controlled and the patient indicates she's doing well with her diet and exercise. And the, patient, the physician schedules the patient for follow-up for one month. The first listed diagnosis would be O24.012 for pre-existing diabetes type 1 in pregnancy second trimester and the second listed diagnosis is V38. Is the 3A.18 for 18 weeks gestation of pregnancy. And the place that you can find the information about the trimesters and how long they are also is in the information of the official guidelines. So here you see the definition of that for the second trimester, 14 weeks, zero days, to less than 28 weeks, zero days. Uh, in Supercoder, we have an ICD-10 workflow that also makes it a little bit easier if those alphabetic lists and the searching um, is a little challenging for you and your physician. This is a more intuitive approach in which the physician, uh, the nurse, uh, the coder asks the several questions that are classified based on medical training in order to get to the correct diagnosis, and then this pulls in all of those additional codes as well right at that same level. Uh, so let's try it for diabetes, the diabetic cataract. You ask what does the patient have? The answer is diabetes. So you go into your comorbidities area. What body system is involved? We have diabetes. And so we select from there. And now we are routed to different tables to choose the, the definitive information as it flows to type 2, ophthalmologic complications, diabetic cataract, and now we have our final code. And in addition to this, we can see that we have to add that Z79.4. And if we had a fuller list, we could click on that and have a whole list that would come up. Our next example on slide 53 is of a patient presenting with a complaint of joint pain. A bone density test is ordered. 
and the result is age-related osteoporosis that is not related to any type of fracture. And the answer is A, M81.0. In order to be successful in ICD-10, it's important that you have a solid foundation in the basic coding conventions, both new and unchanged. And we went over several more of those coding conventions uh, in our June webinar. Be sure you are clear on how to interpret the punctuation used and how to use placeholders, the minimum, maximum amount of codes required. And you can review all of these in our webinar recording from last month. Then you also need to make sure that you're looking up that code if you're using a coding book or electronic tool that allows you to, to first look it up in the alphabetic index and then verify it in the tabular. Make sure that you understand general coding guidelines and follow the instructional notes for proper sequencing inclusion of any associated conditions. Make sure to look for the definitive diagnosis and not the code, any signs and symptoms that are not inherent, that are inherent in that definitive diagnosis. Uh, if there's no definitive diagnosis, that's when you default to your signs and symptoms. An acute condition takes priority in sequencing because it's the active condition requiring immediate attention. Use a combination code when one exists for two associated conditions. Late effects require two codes, one for the late effect and another for the cause of the late effect. Laterality provides additional specificity, so be sure to read your notes provided in the tabular for the code or to check that and make sure you're getting your specific anatomical information captured. Borderline diagnoses are treated as confirmed, so be sure to code to the specific condition. So all signs are to go here for our October 1 implementation date. So we still need information and training to get people up to speed as well as to make sure that you're efficient once uh, the coding work begins. We have several different tools. We have an ICD-10 bridge where you can drop in your ICD-9 codes and have them converted into ICD-10. Uh, that's available right from the Supercoder homepage um, as a free um, upload and download. Um, you also have an active one that's available within uh, Supercoder's code search product um, right along with the code. Um, we also have our specialty training um, in numerous different specialties. Uh, that are available online, and we also offer the same courses uh, customized um, to a certain extent uh, on site as well, and that, that has become a very popular option right now. The resources for this are all available online, um, as well as some free registrations for some training um, and for news updates. You can still save 10% on all Supercoder products and services through the end of the month. Uh, you can use coupon code SUPERICD10 uh, in order to take advantage of that special offering and save some money as you do your final preparations for ICD-10. Thank you all for attending today's event on ICD-10 General Coding Overview. I do have a few questions here. Let's see if I can go through them. If I don't have time, then I will uh, go ahead and uh, put these online for people. So going back um, to the question, 
in case they've used additional code, code that additional code in the second position. Um, no, if they use additional code, um, does not indicate the sequence. So you actually need to look and see if they're variables. Um, if it says code first, um, then you have that exact information, but the use additional code does not indicate that sequence. So sometimes it can uh, depend on the intent of that uh, visit. So that was the example I was giving of um, diabetes and a manifestation um, being at an ophthalmologist or uh, and where is that main intent of that visit? And from an ophthalmologist, we would assume it would be on the ophthalmologist manifestation, not on the underlying diabetes. But that would be the reverse assumption we would make uh, in the primary care setting. Of course, we shouldn't be making assumptions, but here we're just kind of saying that's the general scenario that's going to happen um, of what you, you would expect from clinical practice. Um, is reflux laryngitis? A diagnosis where you would use two different diagnosis codes. There are no instructions to code both, or there is not a combo code. Um, I know that there is a specific uh, spasm of the larynx code, um, slightly different than the reflux. I would have to look that up, so let me look that one up, and uh, we will get back to you on that one. There will not be CEUs offered for uh, today's event. Uh, guideline 11 is regardless of location, yes, for the borderline one. Uh, IBS, um, the constipation and phylactolins are all considered inherent symptoms of IBS. So diarrhea, um, flatulence, constipation, um, abdominal pain, any of those would be part of it. Um, any topic on orthopedics? Yes, we have both um, a specific webinar that was given a little bit ago on that, and then we also have um, uh, our e-learning series for that as well. Will they process the claim and stating that a specific diagnosis required to, to use um, so that you know if the claim's coming back because it didn't use a specific diagnosis? That that would be my expectation that we would see an yielding note that would say that it needs more documentation um, or a new code. Um, so is it going to be somewhat general, and left up to you to figure out if that was it? Um, but I, I would to have that kind of a conclusion. Um, is the one-minute training specialty specific? No, it's a general rotating. Um, do you have to code insulin with type 1? So you do need documentation that insulin um, is being used in order to use it. It could be type 1 or type 2 um, because the definition has changed so that uh, type 1 um, is not usually insulin, but it could be. And the OB code, what would be the primary code be prior to the diabetes? Um, in that example, it was a, an OB follow-up visit for the diabetes. Is there a way to know default codes when another stuff when enough specificity is not given. It, it's not a consistent, like a nine is the last character, but typically when you go through, you will find numerically that they are the end of that section. You report DM inadequately controlled, even if the patient has had hypo and hyperglycemic problems. Yes, and in that case, you would be reporting it as being inadequately controlled. Um, an ICD-10 book, it really depends on your personal uh, preference. Um, some people like that format, and some people like electronics, some people have EHRs where it's kind of direct. Um, 
I like the IC pen as a reference so that I can always flip to things. Um, sometimes I, I put them in, in my bookcase. I don't use them for a while. I use the electronic products on a daily basis, but I like to have that more as a, a reference that I go to when I kind of want to dig in uh, on a more analytical level um, and then have my daily stuff kind of be um, more practical for me. Is IC pen acceptance of erroneous codes in the same category? Only for physician offices, or does it include? I'm not sure what yeah, you're referring to there, um, so we'll follow up. Um, Autolaryngology, um, we will put that on our list. We do have our, our ENT um, e-learning that is uh, coming out as well. Uh, vascular information on the IC10 workflow would be under the cardiology one. Uh, what about syndrome X versus borderline diabetes? Okay, that's a good point. Um, syndrome X, um, it, you would not use that for. Um, so if they've got syndrome X, then you're going to report that. Um, if it's an uncertain syndrome and they're not certain about it, then you're going to go with that. You don't report that uncertain diagnosis. So it's a little bit different. But borderline, you're really going to see with diabetes and hypertension. Um, uh, yes, so the IC10 super bill conversion for free. You just go to supercoder.com, go all the way down to the bottom of the screen on the right, and you'll see the link there for it. Um, I also have it in the presentation. Um, and you just go there, and you drop in either a Word doc or an Excel doc, and you'll get the opposite IC10 codes for that, regardless of your specialty. Um, and yes, you can print those out. I did uh, send around the URL earlier. Um, Uh, and, and I'll repeat that here as well. Um, if you're taking your CPT exam, um, you'll, you will still have to take your ICD-10 quiz update for AACC to maintain that. And we do have some for pulmonology as well. Okay. The E-code, um, I'll have to look at that more specifically. Um, advisors cannot use ECO with diabetic pregnancy if there are no manifestations. Um, you, you, you use that E-code if it is a manifestation. If you don't have a manifestation, it's just the diabetes, then you would just be reporting that. Um, an urgent care one, specific training. Um, would probably fall under our family practice, um, one where we do combine a lot of the procedures uh, that are being treated at urgent care um, because I, I'm in the Florida area, so that's pretty common um, for, for what we have here um, as well for what I, I find convenient. So we have put that in there. We do have a separate one for um, urgent care for the anatomic workflow, Coder 10. Um, in that, we, we use the same kind of philosophy. We're including um, all family practice um, diagnoses, as well as then some orthopedic ones like fracture care. So more extended um, list of uh, injuries that you're treating than the typical family uh, practice would be handling. Um, so I would suggest if you want an e-learning, if you have to do the orthopedic plus the family practice, I think you'd be well covered. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate your patience today. Great group of questions. Um, I encourage you to keep them coming in um, through our, our blog, our Coding 911, and our other listservs. Um, and uh, I look forward to uh, talking with you again uh, next month. And good luck with uh, the next four weeks of uh, being able to make some progress toward our goal.